To Save a Hobbit by Random Pop Bunny. Chapter 12. Gandalf urged his mount and his companions to go faster. They had to reach Erebor before it was too late. They had to. As they rode, he prayed to any and all gods that would listen that they would make it to the mountain before it was too late. When he had first reached the Lonely Mountain, he was to see the chaotic scene of a dwarven army from the Iron Hills preparing for a battle outside the newly excavated and open gates of the once Grand Kingdom, but they didn't seem to know which direction that they should be facing. As he made his way through the ranks, he caught snippets of information. Some said that they were to face the dragon, Smog, while other said a great horde of orcs and goblins were to be their opponents by the day's end. The closer he drew to the gates, the more stares he noticed he was receiving, many of them hopeful while others looked relieved. And once, a captain even said, in a voice he probably thought that wasn't good in here, Thank Mahal, he's here! Maybe now some sense can be knocked into those royals' heads and we can find out who we're supposed to be fighting! He would admit to being highly amused and curious as he entered the mountain, but as he neared the treasury in her thorns raised voice his amusement fled i tell you that if you ever wish to call yourself my cousin again you will help me slay the beast the dwarf king in exile shouted as gandalf stepped unseen into the room and gaped though he would never admit to it as his story did not gape and that is the end of it hm. what what had him not gaping was not the fact that Thorin was holding a sword to his cousin Dane's throat, but rather that the whole of the company, minus Thorin obviously, that had come to slay the dragon and reclaim the mountain were sitting very calmly and at ease next to the still living and not rampaging on the trespassing of dwarves and a hobbit who seemed to be practically sitting in one of Smog's hands into his horde dragon. Now, cousin, don't say such things. And you already have your mountain and treasure back. Isn't that enough? Trying to wrap his mind around the implications of that sentence, was Smog actually giving up Erebor and all that was within it without a fight? Gandalf nearly makes the next exchange. No, nothing will be enough until the worm is dead. But the orcs are no concern to me. Now help me or take your army and leave. It was at this moment that Gandalf realized that Thorin must have succumbed to the gold sickness that had plagued his family line for generations. And as he helplessly watched what happened next, he came to regret ever having convinced Thorin to retake the mountain of his birth. Dane crossed his arms and shook his head sadly at his cousin, but before he could draw breath to speak, Thorin had swung his sword and laid the Lord of the Iron Hill's cheek open. If you do not stand with me, then you stand against me! He shouted as he turned to survey the horrified faces of his companions and his eyes latched onto the dragon who was hovering protectively over the smallest member of the company. Lifting his sword, Thorin charged. No, Thorin, stop! Bilbo yelled as he stepped forward and put himself between the enraged dwarf and the passive dragon. Time seemed to slow to a standstill for the watchers as they watched the scene before them unfold. Even Smog was forced to remain a silent observer of events for what came next. There was a sickening crunch as Thorin backhanded Bilbo with his sword hand and sent the hobbit spinning away a dozen feet or more, only to be stopped by an unyielding pillar and for one horrible second all eyes fo all eyes remained focused on the small man's unmoving form but smog's roar of defiance which shook the very foundations of the mountain and chilled all hearts that heard it finally snapped them all out of it the sound he issued was that of a creature in soul deep pain, and one that would make all others suffer for hurting it so. Before the echoes of his bellow had a chance to stop, Smog had Thorin unarmed and pinned to the floor under his claws. His eyes said all he needed to say about the kind of pain he would put the trapped dwarf in as punishment for his actions. He leaves! Bilbo is alive! Oin called out in the tense stillness that had come over all, and unwittingly saved his king's life. 
snaking his head over to see for himself that Bilbo yet lived, the dragon then turned his full attention back on his prisoner. You pathetic excuse for a king! You might have killed him! And he was so little time remaining as it is! He is not yours to care for! Let me up and we shall see just who truly deserves to care for him! Thorin yelled defiantly as he struggled to free himself from under the dragon's claw, but Smog merely pressed down harder. I think not. There is something, though, that I should have done a very long time ago. So saying, he then brought his other taloned hand up to Thorn's chest and ripped. No! Thorn screamed as the Argus Dome was deftly lifted from the tattered remains of his coat. Tossing the stone high in the air, the dragon let loose his flame. When it landed again, it was not but a broken pile of ash. Releasing the stunned dwarf, Smog walked over to where the company was watching Oin gently care for the unconscious hobbit and lay down to wait for him to regain his senses, if he ever would. Thorin lay still for a moment before sitting up and looking at the ash that had once been his family's most prized heirloom, and then over to where his cousin was holding a dripping rag to his torn face before dropping his eyes to the floor in shame. Why didn't you kill me? He asked while not looking at anyone, but then no one was in any doubt as to whom he addressed. Because he wouldn't want me to, was the simple answer, though the dragon never moved his eyes from where Oin was carefully wrapping a bandage around Bilbo's head. Standing up, Thorin left the treasury without meeting anyone's eye. Well, it seems I've missed quite a lot, now haven't I? Gandalf said, breaking the oppressive silence of the tense group gathered around the pillar and their newly injured friend. Master Orin, if you are done with Master Baggs, then you might wish to see our Lord Dane here. Giving one last look over his small charge, the old healer grabbed his kit and went to sew up his newest royal one. Looking over the rest of the dwarves and the dragon at their side, Gandalf decided that a full explanation of events would need to wait. It was more important now to see to Bilbo's health, and he was sure that Smog would agree. Approaching the bunched-up group, the Grey Wizard addressed the dragon. Master Smog, it is obvious that you care for Bilbo deeply. So, may I ask, why have... Why you have as yet to heal our dear hobbit? Or is it that you do not know how? What? Was the immediately reply that came from every voice in the room, followed quickly by a slew of questions. You make Smog incurable? How? Why haven't you cured him if you can cure him? Do it already! But there is no cure for the wasting sickness. Why would you get our hopes up like this? And so on and so forth. Quiet! Once silence reclaimed the room, Smog turned to Gandalf. Do not play games, wizard. If I could cure him, I would have the day we first met. So the, though the words were spoken harshly, Gandalf could see the glimmerings of a desperate hope in those large eyes. He really hoped to soon learn what had occurred in his absence that had changed the dragon so much the curiosity was becoming almost too much to bear. But you can. Your blood, when even freely, will cure any and all ailments, even those brought on by time. But instead of jumping at this as he had supposed would happen, the dragon merely laughed darkly and turned to gaze dare he say lovingly, down at Bilbo's still form. Whoever told you such horse will? You should know better than to believe such an impossibility, Istari. Straightening his spine, Gandalf went to make an argument in his favor before realizing that he didn't know enough about the dragon blood cure to do so. So instead, he fell back on the old standard. I was told this by the highest of authorities. Smog merely shook his head before laying down in the space the company had vacated for him next to Bilbo. Dragon's blood, by design, is the most deadly poison in existence. Only death will dissipate its potency. Nothing else can ever stop it. So you see, it doesn't matter what you were told. I cannot cure him. Returning his sad gaze back to Gandalf, Smog once more shook his massive head. If I could cure him, I would, even if it meant my own life. But there is nothing I could do. But what if there is? Shaking his head, Smog went to turn from the wizard, only to be stopped by Gandalf's staff coming to rest on the end of his nose. What if I could find someone, someone well-versed in the last knowledge of the dragon, and that will allow you to cure Bilbo, and I bring them here? 
The great wizard could clearly see the hope warring with despair in those giant eyes, but he waited until the hope had won and the dragon had given a tentative nod before adding as an aside to the group as a whole. But will you still be here to receive them when I bring them? Before tempers could rise at the insinuation that any of them would leave Bilbo, he continued, There is an orc army on its way here. You may not have a choice but to retreat. Pushing off the offending staff from his nose, Smog chuckled lightly. Tricky wizard. Very tricky. Fine. I will decimate this army on my doorstep while you go find someone with evidence of an impossibility. Standing with one final look at the small man who had as yet to so much as twitch, Smog turned to the dwarves. Keep him safe, he instructed, and then was heading for the gate and the sky. Gandalf was not far behind him. The captain he had overheard before caught him just as he mounted his seed. Sir, the dragon! What should we do? Leave him be, came the gruff command from Dane, who had followed Gandalf out. Smog is on our side against the orc horde. Spread the word. Form up. We support the dragon. As the call went out and Dane showed his skills in battle planning, Gandalf slipped away. He had to get to Markwood as quickly as possible. I do not care that Smog has had a change of heart or that he suffers for the loss of the Hobbit. His kind can die out for all I care. But surely I say no, Miss my dear. I will not help you, nor will I allow any of my subjects to accompany you back to that filthy dwarven mountain. Now leave and look elsewhere for assistance if you think there is time. Turning on his heel and ignoring the grave insult that doing so would be to the elven king, Gandalf stalked to the gates while musing on how to reach Lothlorien and ask the Lady of Light for assistance. As he reached his mount, he noticed that two more stood next to it. With reindeer, a voice said behind him. Turning about, he took in the sight of the Prince of Mirkwood, as well as a one-armed she-elf standing just behind him dressed for travel. Ah, oh, Legolas, I was wondering if I would have the chance to see you before I left. And who is your friend, may I ask? No time, we can talk on the road. The elven prince said as he swung up onto one of the ready mounts, the unnamed she-elf swinging up onto her own a moment later. When Gandalf hesitated, Legolas leaned down to explain. Father forgave me for letting the dwarves escape, but I doubt he will be as lenient for helping a dragon. Here, he flashed a grin that showed off his young born elf age. But I quite like Bilbo, and if there is a chance that Smog can truly save him, then I am all for helping him do so. He can, but it will be hard work for him. The she-elf spoke up for the first time before turning her mount with ease of long practice using one arm and took off towards the overgrown Erebor Road. That is Langeth, my nursemaid and tutor, as well as my father's and grandfather's. She is perhaps the oldest elf in Mergwood and the smartest, though no one knows just how much she knows. Turning his mount in the same direction Langeth went, Legolas gave another grin before taking off. Mounting in a hurry, Gandalf took off after the elves and sped to catch up with a new hope burning deep in his chest. Perhaps they would be able to save Bilbo after all. Thorin wandered the dusty halls and corridors of his city in a daze, not really aware of where he was going or how long he had been walking until he came to the broken doors of the royal hall. Walking down the rubble-strewn floors to his own room, he went in and sat on the moldy and collapsed bed with his head in his hands. He had attacked Bilbo. He had given in to the gold knackness and attacked Bilbo, nearly killing him. And he had to be rescued from himself by a dragon of all people. A dragon! Taking a deep breath, he tried to sort out what he would need to do from here. Apologize profusely to Dane, for one. How could he have drawn his sword on his kin like that? Despicable! Beg forgiveness from Bilbo for another, though he wouldn't hold it against the small man if he never forgave him. He didn't think he could ever forgive himself. Make alliances with Linktown. Help rebuild Dale, if Bard was amiable. Face his company. That may be one of the hardest ones to accomplish. Blowing out a huff of air, he laid back on the moldy bed and closed his eyes. Orcs! That was an army of orcs headed his way! How could he have forgotten? Rushing from the room, he ran straight into a pair of strong and familiar arms. Dwalin, let me go! There is an orc army! Not anymore, there isn't. Now sit down! 
It's taken hours to track you down, and I mean to have my say before you go running off being stubborn and impulsive. I'm stubborn and impulsive. Now sit down and listen. Thorin sat and listened. And though he didn't like most of what he heard, he had to agree with what his friend said. And there was one point his friend made perfectly clear, and which Thorin agreed with almost definitely. Thorin had a lot to make up for, and he had better get started.